We have Mrs. Jar and the Middle School Student Council. So if they could please come up, they're going to do the pledge for us. And where is Miss Monica? I understand she was coming up to do it with them. Oh, oh, I don't think they thought you were joking. Okay. 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 Come on, guys. Okay, I'm going to introduce who we have here. First, we have Mrs. Jar, who is the Student Council Advisor at the Middle School. And uh, the students we have here tonight, and if you guys will just raise your hand when I say your name so everyone in the crowd knows who you are. Isabel Davalier, Michael Dalio, Riley Good. Cooper Honnold, Landon Honnold, Belly Kennedy, Cameron Moore, and Olivia Point. Excellent. Thank you, guys. And at this time, if we could all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Sure, if you'll eat dinner tonight at all. 
Imagine it's Friday afternoon and you don't know if your next filling meal will be at school the following Monday. It's hard to imagine, but this is the stark reality for some of the families that we work with. There may have been job loss for one or both parents, or maybe the car broke down and the repair has to happen today. A parent or a child may become severely ill. A family may have to decide between paying for medication and buying food. There are many different scenarios or reasons why a family doesn't have the ability to be able to provide food for themselves. This is what it means to be food insecure. Food insecure families exist in our community and in our schools. And these are the families that Backpack Blessings helps. This program has grown and evolved into what it is today thanks to all the wonderful volunteers. So tonight we want to recognize all of the hard work and effort of the volunteers for this program. But before we do, Mr. Uh, Jim Avery, who is one of the coordinators of the program, along with Janine, his wife, who couldn't be here tonight because she's sick, uh, he's going to talk a little bit about Backpack Blessings. See if we can get this launched and we'll go from there. Okay. Right there. Here we go. Um, first of all, I'm Jimmy Avery. Uh, some of you who have been around this uh, community for a long time probably know me. Uh, for those of you who don't, I have been here about 24 years. So. Can't stick can't by the mic. Yeah. By, I, I thought I thought I could project far enough. But apparently I can't. That's fine. Um, so most of you have seen these boxes sitting at the schools, the backpack blessing boxes. Um, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, the program actually started uh, a few years ago uh, when Superintendent uh, Wamsley and Susie Hutchinson, who's a pastor of the United Methodist Church, got together and decided that. They needed to do something about children who were food insecure, who were having to hoard food or come in on after a weekend and just stuff themselves with the free and reduced lunch. Um, Jane and I started working on the program by packing backpacks. Um, at that time, it was truly a backpack program. If you're familiar with any of the backpack programs that exist, essentially what it is is they take non-perishable goods they place them in backpacks and they give the backpacks to the children in need on their way out on Friday with the idea that those backpacks come back on Monday. Um, I know Mom Clements has a little bit of a problem. They issue about 250 backpacks and not all of them come back on Monday, but you know that's the, the way the program happens to run. Um, over the course of time, we gradually assumed some additional responsibility for the program and we decided that there were ways that we could improve it uh, for our children uh, and uh, the families in the community. Um, the number of food insecure children in Michigan continues to grow. There was an article on the front page of the Free Press, I think, uh, last week, uh, something like that, uh, in which they talked about the fact that students in economically disadvantaged districts have grown across the board. Now, that's not just Detroit. We're talking about the suburbs of Detroit. Um, for example, Oak Park School District went from 64% to 79% of their students who were in economically disadvantaged schools. Uh, Gleaners, and I'll talk a little bit more about Gleaners uh, in a little bit, but Gleaners uh, now has roughly uh, 200 school programs as part of their total 500 programs. Um, that means schools are coming to them to get food to help feed their students. Weekend Survival Kits, which is another mid-Michigan program, serves on average every week 11,000 students. That area, they're in Williamston, Michigan, out in the Lansing area, and they cover an area in Michigan. So the students in need are not only growing, but the fact is, is that about a third of our kids are living with a family where the family doesn't have secure employment, which is probably the major problem in terms of trying to meet the needs of the children. So let me, uh, let me talk a little bit about our program, one that serves our community, and uh, we'll try to go through this relatively quickly. 
First of all, the program is solely dedicated to families with children in the Richmond Community Schools. Um, the number of families in the program does vary. Um, we talk about families because you just don't feed children, you feed the family. In the case of where we are right now, we have about 11 families in the program. We have 47 members of those families that we feed. Um, the families range from everything from infants to grandparents. There are any number of homes in which the grandparents have taken in the adult children and the grandchildren as well. The families remain anonymous for our volunteers. They are the only way we uh, identify them is with a letter code. So it's family A, B, C, D. We do keep the numbers and types of members of the family. So we'll talk about or we'll keep a record of the number of infants, adults, children, and so on. Uh, that way it helps us when we develop the, uh, the meal program. We provide two days worth of meals. We provide two dinners, two lunches, and two breakfasts to each family. The families have an option of school pickup or delivery. Uh, we now are only doing delivery. We don't have anyone picking up at schools. And the reason we do that is because we just don't provide canned goods. We also provide perishable foods as part of the program. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. The program runs year-round. It doesn't end when school ends. It goes through the summer. So um, there's a classroom over here, our old science room, that's our official location as far as the district goes. And uh, so we're here in the summer when they're waxing the floors and cleaning up the building. Um, from a resource standpoint, perishable and non-perishable food is donated by the community. That's why you see these boxes. Okay, the food comes in. We go around, as soon as we get a call from the school, we'll pick up that food as part of the program. Uh, we get cash contributions from the members of the community. All of that cash is managed through the UMC here in Richmond. Um, Jean and I don't handle that. Uh, we make sure that money goes there, and then uh, I'll talk a little bit about the purchase process and, and how we get reimbursed for that. Uh, we also get grants. Um, Becky Stewart's here today, and she's one of our volunteers, and. She's managed to write a grant or two for us uh, from Trinity, um, and those come in very handy um, because they managed to refill our cash offer so that we can continue to purchase the goods that we don't receive in donations. Um, we also have volunteers from the community, the churches, and schools that work with us. So uh, it's, a, it's truly a community-wide program. If you look at it from a cost perspective, we spend about $1.20 per meal per person. Uh, now that, doesn't seem like a lot, but when you look at it on a weekly basis, we spend about 300 to 350 out-of-pocket expense in addition to the donations that we receive. Uh, that, when you add up over time, is, is a program that runs about $15,000 a year. So we're, we actively see cash contributions and grants from various organizations. Um, program administration and operations provided by volunteers. Uh, my wife and I, are, we do a lot of the work, uh, as you'll see. But we also have any number of volunteers that come in and will work in the program with us, so whether it's packing or, or helping us uh, with resources. With our current resources, we feel we can support about 12 families or 50 people. We'd really like to increase that because we have more in need than we are serving right now. Um, we also have provided supplementary services to our families. We've had families who needed beds for their kids. We've been able to work with Trinity Lutheran to provide bicycles to some of the children. Uh, we've managed to get mental health care, uh, where we've identified that for a family member. So there are a number of things that happen as a result of the fact that we in interact with these families on a weekly basis as part of our delivery process. Our goal is to provide balanced meals to our family. So unlike a lot of other programs, we're going in with three bags of groceries, two which are basically non-perishable and one which is perishable. Uh, we're going to provide them with milk, we're going to provide them with eggs, we're going to give them bread, we're going to provide a protein. Uh, believe it or not, it's much less expensive to provide a fresh protein than to buy a can of uh, hamburger or something like that, which is the only way you can get them protein. Um, we've created six, the way we do this, because we have limited space here at the school to store things, unlike a lot of food pantries that you'll see, um, what we've done is we've created for those of you familiar with the auto industry, a just-in-time process. So we have effectively six menus that we use, and each week we know what that menu is, we know what we have in inventory, uh, we know what comes in on Sunday from contributions, and we're able to then determine what we have to purchase for that week just to meet that week's menu. That way we keep the actual amount that we have to store to a minimum. Um, so each week there's a, there's a process we go through. 
We do an inventory of the food and stock, we add donations, we purchase what's needed for a given week's menu, and then we go out and we go through this process, of, which we did today, well, I did today because my poor wife was really sick. Um, and with the help of, well, there he is, Eddie, one of our volunteers, one of our student volunteers, we put together and stage and stock for that day. And then on Tuesday, we pack the food, and then Tuesday afternoon, we do our deliveries. Well, Tuesday afternoon and evening. Now, one of the reasons that we do this delivery is that a lot of our families don't have the ability to get to a location to pick up the food. Uh, oftentimes, their work schedules, because they'll work two or three or four different jobs, uh, doesn't allow them to get to a location to pick up the food when the food is available. Uh, so we are flexible. Uh, if, a, if a parent is not available, if a family is not available to receive the food, uh, we'll make arrangements to get them some way. I get to them some way. But it's usually on uh, Tuesdays afternoon and Tuesday evening and we get all the food out. It's not an extensive process. It's maybe 45 minutes in the afternoon and 30 minutes at night. So uh, and we get food out to the families. So this is my little graphic. We start out with the churches on Sunday. Uh, everybody at, at Walmart and Costco and Sam's Club and um, a few other re real real retail spaces know us well because we usually come out with a couple of large baskets full of food. Um, I take that and I've got a traverse, I put all the seats down, and I pretty much pack it top to bottom, front to back, uh, with the food that we need for that week. Um, once we've done that, we bring the, the non-perishables back to the school. We keep the perishables ourselves, and I've dedicated half my garage to this, with two refrigerators and two freezers. And um, basically what happens is we pack the non-perishables in the morning, and then in the afternoon, uh, we bring that back, we pack the perishable items, and we deliver. Um, and then we start the process all over again, because we're going to do an inventory against the next week's menu uh, when we uh, do that pack on Tuesday, and uh, we're all set to start the process again. Um, this is truly a community support or community involvement. Uh, we get support from any number of groups and entities uh, across the, the uh, city. And uh, I, I'd like to give you an example of that. So um, the folks from uh, Richmond Family Video uh, at the holidays um, had a, a number of turkeys. And for those of you who sat through the earlier presentations, I don't really know the count. But I'm guessing it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 25. Um, but we were able to use and provide those turkeys to our families. And what we weren't able to uh, give to our families, uh, we found homes for. And we had, we had a little bit of a storage problem. Uh, I had uh, turkeys deposited at Ken's Country Kitchen in their freezer. Uh, they were, I call it my turkey bank. I would deposit turkeys and take out turkeys as needed. Um, but we did find homes for all the turkeys finally, and, uh, and so they were, they were well used. Um, Kroger is an example uh, where they gave us a stack of gift cards. So when we go to Kroger and we use uh, uh, those gift cards, we're able to purchase uh, on their dollars. So that's pretty much the whole program. Um, just um, from the standpoint of people that are here, Becky Stewart, if you'd stand up, Becky, just please. Team, team Brazilian, she helps us with our campaign. And we only have one of our students, Eddie is here. Eddie comes in on the so, so Neil Salvaggio provides bags for the program, shopping bags, right? Well, to conserve our shopping bags, what I have the students do is I have them staple the handles. And that way we don't have to double pack the bags with all that heavy food. So they do a great job, the job I hate. And uh, they get it done well. Any questions from the board? Okay, great. Um, just one last thing, just to tell you what we want to do, because I want to make sure everybody's clear that this program isn't stagnant, all right? Um, we are working right now to uh, effectively uh, complete an application with leaders. We'd like to be part of their program. Uh, I talked to the people up in Lansing and they said they could cut their costs by half by just using gleaners as a source of their, uh, for their food. Uh, we're also looking for uh, ways to store more here so we can keep them on the shelf and not necessarily have to purchase just in time. Uh, we're also looking to uh, add additional people to the program. I say that, uh, and I always I said this at the earlier thing, you know, my wife and I are in our 70s and our backup uh, are in their 80s. And so we need to find a few younger people that can come in and you know help out with the program. So we'll be looking for that. Uh, we'd like to really improve or increase the program next year, uh, maybe even double it if we could. So 
Thank you very much. Fans of author Patricia, Patricia Blocko, who know her work and her talent uh, for weaving a very colorful family history throughout her picture books. In the story, Thank You, Mr. Faulkner, which is a classic, uh, Mrs. Blocko shares her childhood triumph over dyslexia and discovers discovery of reading as an inspirational story. Young Tricia in the story is eager to taste the sweetness of knowledge that her grandfather has always revered. But when she looks at the words and numbers, everything is jumbled up. Trisha endures the cruel taunts of her classmates, who often call her dumb, and falls behind in her studies. But finally, the encouragement and efforts of a fifth grade teacher, Mr. Faulkner, <coughs> Faulkner excuse me, tr triggers a monumental turning point in Trisha's life. She begins to blossom and develop all of her talents, including reading. Blocko's tale is more than just a heartfelt um, because of its personal nature. This story is an example of the dedicated and determined professionals that teach our students each and every day in Richmond Community Schools. Tonight, we celebrate three of those teachers. At this time, I would ask that Mrs. Ranger, Elementary Teacher of the Year, Mrs. Clawson, Middle School Teacher of the Year, and Mr. Rubin, High School Teacher of the Year, come forward. Come forward. We've got a couple of presentations tonight. Um, every year I reach out um, to our representative, in this case, Mr. Uh, representative Yarich has this, uh, come forth and has a special tribute for these three teachers of the year. So, representative Yarich. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, tell you, <clears throat> excuse me, as the son of a first grade teacher, uh, education and teaching is, is near and dear to my heart. Um, so it's definitely a pleasure to come out and uh, give these uh, tributes. Uh, I'd just like to highlight one piece of it, I could read the whole thing, but uh, Michigan has a long tradition of belief in the value of education. Our state was the first to provide in its constitution for an officer with statewide duties of public education. In the settlements in all parts of the state, hiring a school teacher and finding a place to hold classes were always among the first tasks marking a sense of community for the pioneers. And it, it is, uh, it's important to recognize the, the work of our teachers uh, as they develop the future for our youth. So we have uh, for Teresa Ranger. <laughs> Jamie Fossey. <laughs> and that's the giant road blue there. Thank you, Representative Yarch. Uh, to continue celebrating our award recipients, at this time I'd ask Mrs. Michon, Mr. Bartels, and Mr. Koshin to join me over here. And we're going to begin with, um, let's start off at the high school. All right? So, after each one of the principals presents uh, and recognizes you, uh, if you stay standing up here, and then I'll ask the board to come up front and we can do a shake of hands at the end, okay? So at this time I'd like to introduce Mrs. Michon. Thank you, because you're right, we're usually last. Um, Richmond High School is proud to announce Mr. Rudman as our Teacher of the Year. Mr. Rudman has been with the district for 17 years. Matter of fact, we started together, and I was going to share with them, I have a picture that we took in the first newsletter of us out front. Um, Mr. Rudman loves sharing his passion for science with his students. He is always seeking out challenging labs 
taking the lead on the new science standards and acquiring resources for the classroom. He believes that students come first. He is always available for them if they need extra help, even if it takes time out for lunch. Um, I have a group of young ladies that I know every day where to find them at lunch because they're in there with him. Uh, and he's here before and after school. Um, he is active at our faculty meetings. He coaches. He's also um, around with his camera, um, going to events and things on his own time. So he's very active here at the high school. I have several students here this evening that would like to talk about Mr. Rudman and share why they think he should be Teacher of the Year. I have Julia Akerley, Noelle Riggs, and Jilly Maximuk. Mr. Rudman has impacted my life from the day I met him. He's a man that I, as well as many others, look up to. His passion for teaching and love for the school is seen every day. He never fails to make sure his students are at their best in and outside of the classroom. Not only does he care about his students' education, but he makes sure to always give advice and show his support at sporting events. I can confidently say that Mr. Rubin is a perfect fit for this role and always will be a man I look up to. I'm not surprised Mr. Rubin got awarded with Teacher of the Year. He is one of the most hardworking and caring people you will ever meet. He not only cares about teaching and making sure his job gets done, he cares about the students. There's been so many times where I've been having a bad day and he'll take me aside to make sure I'm alright. Even when he doesn't want to hear it, he will still listen. He doesn't do this just for me, he does this for many students because he's so passionate about what he does. He'll always try to support the students as well. He came to our cheerleading states and took amazing pictures of us competing. Mr. Ribbon is everyone's favorite teacher because he is so thoughtful and kind to all of his students. I couldn't think of anyone better for this award. Congratulations, Mr. Mr. Rubin is one of those people that you say you want to be when you're older. There are so many reasons why I aspire to be him. He is selfless and will give all his time to students no matter if it's a personal issue or if they're struggling in his class. He is caring and will always care about each and every single student who passes or has passed through the door of his classroom, even if they aren't his favorite like me. <laughs> he is passionate about teaching and loves his job and proves, proves to us that he's passionate by teaching us passionately. When I think of the Teacher of the Year Award, I can't think of anyone else besides Mr. Rubin. That's why I came to surprise me when I found out that he won this prestigious award. Congratulations, Mr. Rubin. We are very proud of you. Again, congratulations, Mr. Rubin, for being chosen the High School Teacher of the Year. We're proud to have you on our staff. At this time, I'll introduce Mr. Bertels, middle school principal. Unlike the uh, high school students, I'm not, uh, I didn't write mine on my phone. <laughs> oh, we'll swear. The uh, Jane Clausen uh, came to us um, several years ago. Um, and we are very lucky to have her. She's a very dedicated, passionate teacher. Uh, she is a true teacher leader within RMS, and she always leads with her best foot forward. Uh, she makes um, lasting, meaningful relationships with parents, her colleagues, and most importantly, her students. The needs of her students and students um, that she doesn't have in her class are her first priority in everything she does and everything that she comes to Miss Bork and myself about. And, and when she's coming, you always know it's in the best interest of students. On a typical day, Jamie must walk at least 100 miles. She is always on the go. And whether it be helping students, working with teachers during their prep hour, go over strategies to help um, her students succeed, um, she pushes in classrooms to check on her students, both academically and, em and emotionally, um, in, in um, the classroom. And she makes peer observations. She's never sitting down and when she's teaching. It's always hands-on and interactive with her students. Um, and she likes to decorate. And her room is very comfortable. Um, it's an excellent place for learning, uh, learning targets, uh, learning tools, and, and, and it 
exemplifies education, but it's also warm and welcoming. And she also does that to our teaching lounge. Um, you know when there's a new a, a new uh, holiday coming up because it is decorated by her and uh, Mrs. Pietzel and Ms. Karkoff. And uh, it helps me when I see, okay, we have St. Patrick's Day coming up a month before St. Patrick's Day. So she, Christmas early, she'll probably start that in July. So with that being said, we have two students up here. Several students um, were talking very kindly of her the other day when we were talking about this. Um, but a lot of um, her students were shy. We have two excellent students here and uh, two brave students, uh, Savannah Kirby and Cody Bennett, to talk about Mrs. Lawson. Hi, I'm Cody Bennett, I'm sixth grade. My name is Mrs. Lawson, it's my sixth grade, grade math teacher. She's very loyal to me and students and parents uh, anywhere we go uh, when we have concerts or something we always see mrs. Ranger sees former students talks to them just like you know she still has them in class so she definitely is able to build that relationship um, also all the different activities uh, science night one of the famous most popular parts of science night is Rangers Rockets uh, where students get to do that uh, McStaff night which here's a little plug it is tomorrow night at McDonald's from 4 o'clock until 7 o'clock uh, percentage of the proceeds will go to the lead QBS program. But if you go there, you will see Mrs. Ranger, her favorite spot behind the counter, uh, usually helping getting the drinks, uh, getting the uh, orders for the parents and for the students. Uh, something new this year, uh, Spanish Club, uh, another opportunity for uh, students to learn some uh, cultural differences and just to expand their world, uh, learning a little bit about Spanish and their culture. Now, at the elementary school, as I started reaching out, uh, having some students, some were, I'd love to be there, but not sure I really want to talk, or the parents were saying, not sure they want to talk. So just make it fair and have a little bit of fun, uh, like you like to do at the elementary. Uh, I just want to reach out to all Mrs. Ranger students who want to come up at this time. Come on up, everybody. Once again, it just shows how well uh, Mrs. Ranger is liked and respected in the classroom. Not only do the students want to be there, but thank you to all the parents who brought the students there. They're not driving on their own yet, so uh, they still need the parents to drop them off. So I know some of them want to draw pictures, write notes. Let's see if anybody's brave enough to come up and talk. Or it's a cordless microphone so I can take it out and give it to them. 
Okay. Okay, when you come up and talk, please introduce yourself first. And then anything you anything you'd like to say about Mrs. Ranger. Mr. Tober, he asked if he could say something, so uh, if you can please come up. And then students, when Mr. Tober's done, then I'll have you uh, give some of your gifts and cards to uh, Mrs. Ranger. I was, I was worried that uh, he said the goal was to make Ms. Ranger look good. I think that makes it look good right there. I don't know how I can beat that. I just wanted to mention a couple things that uh, stood out about Ms. Ranger. And Richmond Community Schools. Uh, uh, Jonathan's in Miss Ranger's class. Uh, we, me and my wife just had our fourth child, and uh, we outgrew our home. We're working with a realtor, and uh, we gave her everything we need in the price range, and uh, we told her we want to be in Richmond. I work in Richmond, and I go home on my lunch break and see my kids, and she keeps bringing me these houses in Yale, St. Clair, and all over the place. You know, why can't you find one in Richmond? It's hard to find a house in Richmond because we got the best EMS, great fire department, awesome police department, and mostly the schools. Everybody wants Richmond schools. And that's a blessing, and I know it's because of teachers, like these ones <coughs> staying up here right now. And uh, everybody knows, as we go out there, it could be Home Depot, fast food, there's just employees out there that are just there for a paycheck. They just want to get by, they want to get out of there at five o'clock, and uh, like Miss Ranger, you can tell she's a person that's there. She loves her job. She loves her students. And countless times I can tell you where she's bought things for the, the book fair, where the kids didn't have money to buy things or provide snacks. She's just an awesome. And thank you for making my home value go up. <laughs> okay, students, at this time, I think you want to go see Mrs. Ranger, don't you? Come on over. And even had one student who was unable to make it, so she left the card on my desk to Mrs. Ranger today. Thank you. 
Okay. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm going to do that. This is a little bit of new territory, so bear with us here. Um, we uh, the motion that we just made to open the superintendent's contract for budgetary reasons um, is section one um, of uh, Mr. Walmsley's contract, where um, he had. Okay. Amendment number four, section one. section one, employment, where it discusses um, the daily and operational needs of the district. There were certain positions that were in that part of the contract, and um, Mr. Walmsley is looking to open that up to revise those, one of those positions, and to um, create another one um, for budgetary reasons. And um, the position he's speaking to remove is the director of curriculum. And the position that we will have conversation about creating is a director of facilities and operations. So that everyone understands and is up to speed on that, we will move forward with our 2019 budget presentation number two. Okay. Um, since our last budget discussion, um, we were waiting on the uh, house budget in your packet. First item. budgets released from the state um, or Richmond Community Schools. They are all with the per pupil proposed foundation allowance is within $10. Uh, the governor's budget for Richmond would be a $240 per increase uh, per pupil. The house concurs with the governor's recommendation. It says 120 to 240 because it's based on a 2x formula. Those that have a low foundation would get two times those that have a higher foundation. Those that are in the middle of some calculation between. But for Richmond, it's $240. The House budget would be $240. The Senate budget for Richmond would be a $230 per pupil increase. Um, so it would be my recommendation that the board build the budget on the $230 per pupil increase when we will start looking at um, the actual budget. The other documents, and again, we, we can talk about it at some point because it will have some effect on the budget, are different aspects of the, the general budget, um, whether it's uh, online education, uh, which we do not have, but some of the budgets are paying still at 100% as we are now, or the governor's budget comes out at 75. So some of this doesn't affect us, other than it will affect us if they reduce that per pupil all being in the $230 range, I would recommend that we base our budget on that $230. So with that being said, if we go down again, we'll start looking at enrollment projections as we did last time. Excuse me now. Is this the kindergarten? 
current number is that you had. The 90 is what you already had that's come through. Um, round up in that, is that what? No, we are not 90, we are not 90. Anymore. We are around 55, okay. is where we were at that last, last year around this time. Okay. Here we take a, a number. We ended with a hundred and three. So this is the this is why. So here we go. So if you look at the 1819, we have ended with 103. If we assume 90, move everybody up FT wise, we would be a total of 50 FTs down. But when you do the 90 10 blend account, it would be 37.6. Seven F student FTs down. So is the board comfortable with this recommendation moving forward that we use these student enrollment accounts to build our budget going forward? Yes. With that, now we look at well, what does that do to the budget projection? $140,000 structural problem that was in the amendment that we did in February. With that blended count, and if we assume 230 rather than 240, the lowest of the three budgets, um, that actually would generate $30,000 more in revenue. Now we're down. It generates $30,000. So that puts our structural problem at $190,000. So, so that 109 is what we would attack. Is the board in general still comfortable with the 230 number based on the three budgets that have been presented by the House, the Senate, and the governors? Yeah. It's the lowest of the two. So because 240 it benefits us, we're going to have to Okay. So now we're looking at well, how are we going to address that structural. How many students is that? 109,000. How many students does that represent? Is that 30,000? 109,000. 
currently, if there is a work order that goes through that requires the heating to be adjusted, a screen to be fixed, um, a light bulb that's out, um, a toilet that plug that needs a plumber comes to my office. Um, between myself, I then forward it on to the contractors, whether it's Wagner Plumbing, Richmond Electric, um, I meet with them. Um, one of the items the fire suppression system that probably was that aspect of getting quotes in that process. I could easily probably account for 30 hours of my time just coordinating that aspect alone. Um, so all of those duties would go to the director. Uh, ordering paper towel, ordering green soap, that order comes to me, I place the order, um, or I ask Carrie to place the order if I'm not available, or I ask Pam. Um, we've got a system now, so all those would go to the director. From the curriculum end, it would, um, our, our administrators are definitely, the, from the principal end, are focusing more on the instruction in the building. Um, the beans are formally, though they are part of the instruction, <coughs> they are more on the non-instructional aspects of the building. Um, we'll work overseas athletics, so that's a huge chunk of our time. Mr. Reinhardt, that's a huge piece of his time to coordinate high school. Um, the last two years, we've done grade level meetings.
from nearing the bottom to the top? And how do you maintain that? So a lot of that conversation has to be the principal driven um, because they're the ones in the building every single day. They see the what goes on in the classroom. They know how to address that. So um, we, we put some structures in place for resources.
so we can just because there's not time during the week to get it done. So if I have an operation and part of the mm -hmm. lag, and I think if you ask any staff member in this district, there's been a lag because if I have a B problem, I'll just use that example, probably not the best example, um, and I need to call it get exterminated, it comes to me or Pam, if I'm not in the district seeing that, there may be a couple of days before I contact Rose Exterminator to get out there to solve the problem. Or these will go right to the, that is that person's job, is to make sure our buildings are safe, that our locks are working, our lights are on, supplies are ordered, it's maintained. Um, you know, four day we do painting every year. You know, four day with the contractor who does the paint, we say, okay, I want these rooms done, when are they going to be done? Right now, that's me. And I, I ask the building kind of, what is their, wish list, if you will, um, in terms of painting. Sometimes I can get it to them in terms of office painting or classroom painting. Sometimes I can't. It's just prioritizing the, the dollar. And that's really what that facility first does. Um, I first year I didn't do anything. To be honest with you, that was all Sam did. Yeah, he taught me that every week for about an hour. It's, that's basically a big thing. Is there anything that's, that's going to be potentially large ticket item? Um, proactive, you know. Coordinating inspections, the fire extinguisher inspections, the bleacher inspections, the um, furnace inspections every year, um, the building walkthroughs. Currently, every other day, I'm, the, I'm doing the building walkthrough at, at the um, lot to make sure there's no broken pipes and no vandalism and stuff. You know? so, so I'm shifting those duties to the facility, but I also got to pick up my own my role if we're going to get to that next level. I got to do much more active. <clears throat> Which may mean I'm doing more walkthroughs of buildings. I may be more in the classroom. So I'm going to give my two cents to administrators what's their work. We're going to have a conversation, much like we did um, in the first year. As far as the contract itself, um, we voted not long ago to, to agree to minimally employ a number of different positions that are recommended in your contract. And you're asking us tonight to approve adding the facilities director and striking the curriculum director. I would just ask that rather than strike it, that we put the language that it's agreed that at the beginning of a certain date that we're not going to, we agree not to have that position based uh, until we mutually agree on the parts. You know, things have changed since we've done, we did the contract a couple years ago. know where I'm going to find you guys 109,000 without completely cutting. And I can say right here, cut all counselors. We solve the problem. But is it the best that you can get? It's going to create a doubt. Um, you know, class sizes are right at that order where they're around 25 to 27. There are some that are higher, you know, especially some unique courses. Um, without cutting, we could, we could cut programs have not run I'm just making this up because first we can cut uh, criminal justice but I gotta put those kids somewhere so I'm gonna force kids into classes they don't want or I'm gonna create another expense and have them do a roll of classes and now we gotta increase the budget there so we have in the last four years and I think a lot of it has been with conversation we have tightened our staffing and I believe it's tight as we can get it without cutting programs for kids. We're at a point now where we've eliminated almost $400,000 deficit. We have not cut any other than elementary Spanish and the final person. First, we haven't cut any programs for kids. We've added programs. Um, we've added after school activities for kids. Restructured for them. We have a contract in place with the teachers for next year that has um, cost, the reduction in the energy bond is helping pay for that income cost. So that money is just shifting from one account to the next. Um, we've got a contract with administrators through June of 19. Um, so there's some stuff that, that, that they would do, whether it's a half step or an off schedule. Um, we are in negotiations with the food service and bus drivers. Those contracts are not settled. The care program, I believe, is settled through the I think we have one more year. What I'm trying to position is you know, all of our bargaining units have 
given to help the district over the years, whether it's for or days, whether it's taking reductions or, or change in the contract. Um, at this point, there's nothing else to cut unless they're going to say cut a program to, give, to, to address any increases they're going to want in the contract. Now, the benefit is if we are off on our projection because we get more kids and more dads like that speak up in this community, we have more of those families that choose Richmond, it's only going to be a benefit us. And then at some point, if we feel that it's important to um, look at it, uh, we had a conversation at one point about doing a half-time curriculum, half-time special ed director, uh, putting it into one. Having half-time positions is very difficult to fill. They're not possible unless you're going to find a, a retiree hire from an administrative perspective. <coughs> asking the question about it was two months ago the curriculum director position was absolutely necessary to success of the district and we're here two months later um, and that position is totally dispensable um, so I, I don't like my question is whether it's absolutely necessary that we add this position to the contract the facility director position to the contract or whether we can just create this position without having to specifically add it to in the year's time, maybe this position will decide it won't be necessary and they'll have to reopen the contract to and amend the contract. Is it really necessary to do that or can we just create this position and, and agree for the time being not to fund it? Prior to me asking for that in my contract, those positions, this board had the option of eliminating all those positions. There's nothing I can do if you can vote to eliminate all those positions. The reason why I asked them is because I believe to be a back in this organization, those positions are critical. Do I believe the curriculum director is critical? Absolutely. But I don't know, I'm at, well, I'm at the end of ideas to fix the budget structure without cutting off work. If we want to fix it some other way, we can do that and keep the curriculum director. But I don't know where we're going to get it without cutting. So it, it's, I guess it's, it's a, I think the timing runs because assumption, um, obviously if, if, uh, if it does settle, it would ultimately be the curricular arts director's <coughs> choice. I make the assumption he will still be in the organization. Well, and I, and I also think two months ago, and I, I, I don't know where Brian never said he thought the curriculum director position was, what was the word you used? Necessary. Necessary. Um, I, I, believe, I believe if we really look at it as a board, Two months ago, when we were talking then, we were looking at things being the same positions that needed, and the reality is, two months later, Mrs. Mushan is retiring. We did not know she was going to write. Lots of things happen. Budgetary things happen. You have to look at where, where we're at, what we can do, and to be able to say that we want to remove this position, and our administrators are capable curriculum people, Brian is extremely capable. So in order to save money to not lose programs or anything else, this is a position. I don't know, never did he say it wasn't necessary, and I don't believe that it's not a necessary position, but I believe that what we want to do, what he's looking to do right now is absolutely necessary right now. And I'm all for saving money. My question is just whether we need to add this position as one of those listed positions. <coughs> I think when that language was voted on in December, it was clear that what Brian was stating a support team that he needs to be able to do his work. And the majority of us were in agreement that it's important for him to be able to articulate that and to be written down in the contract. The support team he needs to be able to have to do his job. Things change. Budgets are always fluid. And when you're dealing with a budget that is 90% people, <laughs> That means that's fluid, right? So um, I think it's still important for that language to be present in a contract that says this is the support team that a superintendent needs to do their job. Wasn't the uh, positions that were created totally dependent on the budget anyway, whether they stayed or whether they weren't renewed, always dependent on what the outlook of the budget was? Prior to it being put in my contract, it was at the room of the board. By the entry in the contract,
contract, the board's committed that when we start the budget process, these are automatic. Mm -hmm. uh, finance person, someone to run the payroll, someone to run the pay the bills, the council medical payroll, my administrative assistant, Those were, but prior to that, you, you could easily have said, Brian, we're going to cut the director of special education and, and give it to whoever or take it on yourself. You always had that ability to work. I just asked my contract, not asking for any raise, could you commit to this staffing so that I could run the district? Given as Tracy mentioned, the fluid nature of the budgetary process, I just feel like having these positions and writing to the contract makes it harder to be with the engineers, harder to change positions, harder to adapt. But it's a good myth that's already a part of this contract, right? And so we're talking about adding another position to that contract, which. And eliminating the one that's twice the cost, almost twice the cost. And in addition to that, you've shown uh, good rapport in delivering us with uh, option that is going to eliminate some costs from that. So I, I feel confident that he's making a decision that's in the best benefit of the school district. They're so keeping the students um, centered in that discipline. I can see where Ryan's coming from, though. I'm in agreement on the changes that you're proposing, Ryan, so I don't have a problem with that. I think where, what I take away from what Ryan's saying is I trust that Ryan's going to do what he needs to do. He's going to come to us with the positions that he thinks he needs, and I'm good with that. It's just a lot of extra steps. Like if next year there's a different position because of people shifting or moving or retiring, then we have to go back into the session to see if we can amend the contract and then come back out and discuss and then vote. It just seems like a lot when it could just be a simple discussion of, I'm recommending this and this, and we say yes, and then we move on with our day. I just reiterate to the board, think of back to June 2016. The question was asked of me, do you want this position or should we cut after school activities for kids? I'm not going to say cut after school activities for kids. That was the uh, public relations and community relations secretary. So I chose to cut it, figure it out. Luckily, our enrollment would change and we had some other things that we were looking at. That's the position I was in. I'm not going to cut programs for kids unless you're at the board, you're telling me that's the only way. If I can give you, we can cut off all the athletics. There's two hundred thousand dollars right there. I could say we'll lose kids. I could say eliminate transportation. There's three hundred dollars. We will lose kids. Um, cut all after school to be positions. There's a hundred and twenty thousand dollars. I don't know how much But there's that means robotics is gone. Student council is gone. Yearbook is gone. Green Club, we can do that. It's going to affect kids. And I didn't think the purpose of this conversation was to rehash whether the amendment, the fourth amendment, or amendment four, is in fact valid. We're only here having a conversation as to whether the language needs to be changed. So I, I hear that the direction that the two of you are wanting to take the conversation is whether the a fourth amendment is even valid in his contract or not. That's already been decided. That's it's even for, uh, totally incorrect. I'm, I'm okay. wondering whether we need, if Brian wants to agree to strike the curriculum director from the, from the contract and give him the flexibility to, to create this facilities director position, that's wonderful. That's seemingly that's great. I don't see the need to add another position to the contract, thus restricting our ability to change that position in the future. But what you're saying is, that, that, but, but that is the idea, the whole idea of done the amendment doesn't allow for Brian to have the language that says these are the people, this is this is the team that I need to have. I think, I think Brian's point is valid in, in what he's asking, but I really think it's conversation <clears throat> that happens, needs to happen down later on when we amend the agenda again. That's, that's where your point needs to come in because if you if, if you don't if you're if, if you're not if you don't believe that the um, that the curriculum director should come out and the facilities director should go in then later on down in the meeting when we 
talk about actually bending the contract. That's what that's what we're actually on the camera. Correct. Okay, so you're right. Let's talk about that. So I, the, the, from the budgetary perspective, if we if we go down this road of making the change, um, will help us get to a, a zero structural problem or very close to it. Um, the other two items from a budgetary perspective, um, and I put them in the backwards order on your thing, so it's my fault, I apologize. First is freshman sports. Uh, in your document, it is um, 10-4-A. Uh, in December, Mr. Reinhardt presented an update on freshman sports. I'll just scroll to the second page, which is the back. This is the exact same document you got in December. So when you look at freshman sports, um, it cost us total. Seventeen thousand, probably seventeen thousand dollars. Seventeen. Let's go eighteen thousand to per round numbers for say, and we raise about ten thousand in revenue, whether it's pay to participate, gate fees, etc. At the end of this year, we have no money left for freshman sports because freshman sports, sports, excuse me, some of them start before. The conversation that that I would ask the board to entertain is. Do we just assume in the budget that we are going to pay for freshman sports? We'll pay to participate, the students will pay to, pay to participate, we'll collect the gate receipts, etc. And then we make a decision on whether a freshman sport will run or not based on enrollment. Um, currently, um, Mr. Reinhardt was able to give this to me. Um, in the BWAC, for football with KPAC leaving and the North Brands coming into our league next year, um, there are only five of the two, four, six, eight teams in the BWAC that have freshman football. Um, there are, again, that's assuming KPAC leaving and North Brands coming. Uh, for volleyball, there are seven that have a freshman sports. Boys basketball. Um, there will be with North Branch coming in. As of now, there will be eight um, boys basketball. Currently, KPAC does not, but North Branch does. Currently, only four teams offer a girls basketball. It's offered, but we don't run it. Um, they never run it because of numbers. We're one of them. We did not run a girls' basketball. We offered it, and we had to make a reduction. In freshman baseball, there are three teams that have baseball in the b with North Branch being one of them coming in next year. So if it wasn't for North Branch, only two of the teams, Almont and Richmond, would have freshman baseball. So the challenge we have is, is Again, I know the board's direction was for parents to raise money. And forgive me, I don't remember the exact year. It was several years ago. Um, the challenge we have is getting parents to raise the money. And by the end of this year, that account will pretty much be zeroed out. So if the intent is to run freshman sports, my recommendation would just be assume the $8,000 cost in the budget losing revenue, which is what the school should be giving up, just run fresh towards. And then run it based on numbers. So I would sit down with Mr. Reinhardt and we would establish a minimum. So if football needs 11 guys on the team or 11 players, excuse me, not just guys, 11 players, um, maybe we say the minimum is 15. I don't know what that number is, but we have to set a minimum that has to be on the team for each one. Much like we did with girls basketball. Girls basketball freshmen this year. Don't point me out. We had very few on it, maybe five or six. We didn't have enough. We yeah. didn't have enough. We didn't have enough to make it where if someone would have gotten injured, that we, you yeah. know, we would have had like seven. If we had girls. six and one got injured, then five yes. would play the whole time. Yeah. So we didn't have a ninth grade girls basketball. We did we not this year. Ninth grade girls We offered it, but we didn't have enough. And how many ninth grade boys basketball players were there? Do you know? We we had probably fifteen. Yeah, 
it was 13. Where are people going to go? Sorry, 13. I can get to the I didn't ask Mr. Ryan. Just to understand what leagues. Because um, our option is we don't run freshman sports, and those students have the option.
So that would, be, that would be something that would be an expense in the budget if we, if we want to, um, I guess, end this yearly conversation of Russian sport with the caveat that we establish what minimum is needed in order for it to work. Can we can we get middle school sports information? Numbers and the cost.
because of that situation. I'm talking about stops that we aren't created that we would put on the route because of a request that came in. Brian, do other, um, are there other districts that do something similar? I am not aware of any district in Macomb County that does. Because they don't transport to um, businesses properly, right? The, 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 the routing system does not, I can't say it's 100% they don't, but I can say that's not a practice that they do. So that becomes so good. Just, I mean, I mean, if you already remember this, forgive me, but just to recap, I was planning on putting this forward. We had the conversation in August. I chose not to move forward with changing it because I didn't, you know, I didn't want to create waves at the start of the school year. We had a good year starting and everything was not possible. Um, but so I opted to have, if we want to do this, what we are right now is we are we we have you know, any parent asks us who lives in transportation zone the transfer I want to stop. We have nothing that says no. We don't need it. We, we can't. We have to create a stop. We set the practice because we have stops whether it's treasure front or whether it's a previous daycare that we have. Uh, we have created a stop. When a parent calls.
items that they said that they were looking that they needed, we, we have met those by the summer program that we're doing, that your kids, um, you have your daycare, your year-round daycare, all of that. I, I just don't know why we are interested in transporting people to a competing system. I, I, I don't know if that's the right. Are we comfortable? The question was at the time of that meeting that, that the issues were the year round by being able to have your kids something all year round. The Richmond's daycare ended when the school year ended. I would agree with that. Um, I will tell you that the parents that sort of, those were the exact words that they said. So we we are meeting that. We we have provided we have reached out and created this thing with the city that we're doing so we have we have responded to the issues that those parents brought that night. I have seen firsthand on social media people say about our summer care program they are unable to utilize it because we don't go young enough and because they have younger siblings that they also have to account for. As a mother of small children I am not going to drop my infant off at this daycare and my six-year-old off this place. I don't have time for it. I don't to work. And I absolutely, I get that and I respect that. That's, why is that our problem? I wouldn't say it's our problem, but I would say it doesn't, I don't think it hurts. I think it helps the families in this district. We are a small town community. We are all about family. I think it's helpful and it's nice of us to be able to do it. I don't think that it hurts us that much financially that we can't have stuff. But you, but, but you open the door to so much more of a home daycare, someone who's got a home daycare in Canterbury, someone who's got a daycare right. here. But if we were to put a number on that identifiable benefit, I mean, if parents decide that this is an identifiable benefit, and then the school district says, all right, well, we've got to have 10 people stopping there. I think that would close the door then from Putting them in, you know, one person going here, one person going here. Pick a number. What what uh, what number do we break well, even? Many of our stops are can be seen from the stops and stops being under the current board. Just the rules of it. And our our group stops where we have over our like Angela's as uh, in town stops. So the number of kids at that stop I don't think is a, it's a fair number necessarily to use because we do have a lot of stuff. Off. And that changes every year. Ron, how, how long ago was it that you said the daycare contacted you a while back and asked you if you could create a staff? Is that right? No, I, I have never been contacted by okay. any daycare. That we just, when, some, how did we get in the practice of doing that? Someone called transportation. I said, sure. I was going to stop. Okay, so transportation approved this. How long ago do you know? A year before I got here. So it's been a few years. And since then, have we had any other requests like this? Like that? daycare request and we'll try to do Our home daycares have changed based on we still have home daycare. Do you know how many people are you talking about for home daycare? How many stops are you talking about right now currently? This is what I'm Currently, that I know of today without looking through the entire transit zone, one. That's true. Because I'm just thinking if we can if we can modify this at any time, I'll have evidence why you can get to us tonight. We talked about it at the beginning of the year. If it becomes out of control or out of hand, we can always revisit it. But at the current level that people are trying to utilize it, it doesn't seem to me that it's a problem on the district resources. In my opinion, it's servicing kids that go to Richmond. It doesn't appear to be a significant work. If that changes with the amount of requests that come in all of a sudden, I don't think we can go in and look at it for another year. But right now, with the current standing, I, I just don't see it as a can this be grandfathered in? I don't think we want to grandfather in. No, I mean, the, but the policy does say adding non-residential bus stops. This one currently exists and has existed for several years. It's non-residential. So how many years have how, how many years have we been dropping people off here? So for at least four years. But going back to the comparability of services, in addition to what Sarah said about not accepting younger siblings in the summer program, is the Child care program. Does the child care program at school accept kids that are not preschool age? 
correct? That's really what's happening. I have some other questions. Are we going to go through the rest of this? or The rest of what? Of this uh, transportation? No, Dave, but I just said. No, not, about, not about this issue. What else about transportation? You know, there's a, I, I had a question about uh, the uh, installation of uh, surveillance cameras. Is that something that we've agreed to, or is that something that you're thinking of? We do. It's already Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Any new buses that we get come with cameras. In the next bond series, we have, I believe, five buses that still have VHS tapes. We would convert those systems over to um, the digital systems. So that all buses would have video cameras on. So and they are, and we, we utilize them when there's problems on the buses. Uh, if, if I could ask just two quick questions, and that is how long are those videotapes maintained for? From the day that the transportation happens? You maintain them for a week or 72 hours? Legally, and I'd have to double check that, but legally we have to keep them for 30 days. After 30 days, we can be over it. I'd have to verify that beyond a minute, sure. Right. And is there anybody that is um, uh, routinely reviewing these? We only review the videotapes when there is an issue.
Other than that, I know we'll probably be here after the school year for our true performance, so I'll kind of give you an update for Worlds once we get that. But uh, if you guys are interested, we will be competing Thursday and Friday at uh, Cobo Hall in Detroit, and then Saturday also at Cobo Hall, and then if we are to go far enough, we will be competing at Ford Field. Um, so obviously it kind of depends on how things work out. But Thursday and Friday at Cobo Hall, Saturday at Cobo Hall in the morning, and then afternoon hopefully at Ford Field if we get there. So it's in the morning, um, Thursday and Friday. Thursday and Friday, we're competing all day. Like from so, the start, it starts what time? Uh, starts at 7 30. We'll be there until 5 30, 6 o'clock. So. Is that Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, same start time? Thursday and Friday, and Saturday, we start at 7 30, and then uh, we will do our interdivisional rounds until about 1 30. And then if we are to be fortunate enough to win our division, we'll move on to the World Championship quarterfinals and semifinals, hopefully, if we already get that far and at Ford Field and start at 6.30. 6.30 at night? Yep. Okay. Well, I'm really hopeful that the Times Herald or the Voice newspaper does an article on this because this is really great for Yeah, they actually wrote an, uh, the Times Herald wrote an article on us the right before our Marysville competition. Right before, uh, I can go ahead and send you guys the email of the link when I get a chance, but um, they actually came out and uh, were, they were in here videotaping the robot and stuff, so it was pretty cool. I, I also am in contact with The Voice. They're going to write an article for us after the World Championship, but I'm also in contact with the school newspaper. Get Terribly impressive. Good. Really, you guys have done such a great job. Thank you. I appreciate something it. that just a few years ago was just a little flip on the map, and you know, you've just run it, so good for you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Have a great job. All right. Anybody else? Hi, I'm Sue Slimane. Most of you are going to know a lot of you, but um, again, I'd like to thank you from the robotics team. I'm part of that. Boosters, we're not boosters, but part of the parents, and it's, it's a great club. My son, who is average, for his freshman this year, he's on the robotics team, he's also on the trap team. So, my concern when you were talking about cutting freshman sports. Now, my son played baseball until this year. He isn't, well, it wouldn't have been had he decided to go out for baseball. He wouldn't have qualified to be on the JV or the varsity team. He's not for that, that student or that athlete. So, by cutting freshman sports, if he wanted to go to baseball, he wouldn't have been because it's an uncut sport, right? So if you cut the freshman sport, he wouldn't have been good enough to get on JV, so then he would be sitting at home. So I think that's something that needs to be addressed when you're thinking of cutting the freshman sport. It's not only the total number of students, but the students that wouldn't necessarily then be able to play at all. Yes, I agree that the parents should fundraise. That's what I do all the time, 24-7. Um, but that's something to think about when you're cutting the budget. And I know that you guys already voted on the transportation, but I was, I have to agree with what I see Sarah said. I get I get why we don't want to compete, you know, pick up at a, at a competitor, but you also could lose the students. So is the $350, yes, as a business, they should pay for it. If I owned a business, I would pay for it. But we have to think of the other end. What if four kids left the district because they found a, a place that they could transport from a different day. So now you're looking at a basically, what, 7,000 a kid, approximately, that you lose for $350, or whatever the fee was. It's just a thought. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are you coming up? I am. Okay. Sorry. I didn't know if you were walking out or. No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no. Uh, John Slater, uh, Richmond High School teacher and coach. And just on the freshman sports, it, and I know you're not answering questions, but I thought we did a fundraiser. Um, and Chris isn't here. But, um, I don't know if you could look into that. Wasn't there a fundraiser for the new? We, we did another one in August to apply, I mean, you don't have to answer it, but it's something to think about when you have the discussion. I thought we did raise some money for the next round or whatever we could afford. Um, and I, I do, I, I hate putting a number on it, but it does, if you lose one FTE, you've, you're at a wash. If it, if it costs $8,000 and an FTE is 7400 or whatever, um, you know, it's, it's a wash and I believe 
you know, Brandon Day's always quoted me numbers about the number of kids that come here to play. And, and, and it's, it's legit, and he can give you the stats on that. The kids have come over and will come to Richmond because we do have freshman sports. It's just something to talk about. Um, what I really want to do, though, is come up here and um, thank Haley Fortuna, who's not here. But it's public, so thanks, Haley. Um, but she's such a wonderful student. You guys know that. I, I know you always need to have that said again, but she did such a great job in the play. But just to sit here for, was it been three years? or is it Three years, right? Yeah. Incredible, right? That's, that's real dedication, and I really appreciate that. And uh, Deb Michon announced her retirement today, so i just like to... Wish you the best, and um, just like to say that you've made me a better teacher, and I think the whole high school staff would agree with that you've made us a better teacher in a better place, so thanks a lot. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay, next Board of Education student rep report. Haley could not make it tonight, but she sent me her stuff. So, Lee School, on April 20th, the PTO passed out trees to all the students to celebrate Earth Day. Um, as Mr. <coughs> Koshin said, tomorrow night is staff night at McDonald's uh, from 4 to 7. On 427, they are having three different assemblies, a True Blue Assembly, Anti-Bullying Assembly, and a Test Prep Assembly. Is that correct? Uh, the middle school, uh, their final four with fathers was a great success. They had it uh, the morning before school on 329. Several dads were able to be in attendance. The National Junior Honor Society held its annual Rainbow Connection fundraiser. Miss um, Corbett, you weren't the winner this year. Well, Mr. Mr. Hamlin was the winner, had the most money donated in his name, and he got to be duct taped to the wall. Um, and there were representatives from the Rainbow Connection at the assembly and they got the donation that day. Richmond Middle School Digital Talent Extravaganza was a few weeks ago with multiple entries. Uh, this is the Richmond Middle School Follies event for those of you that are old school know that. Um, and Richmond Middle School has received green school status at the high school. Best of luck to the robotics team as they head to Worlds this week in Detroit. Congrats to the Little Women cast and their show that they had last weekend. Our varsity girls soccer team is currently ranked 15th in the state. Congratulations to Allie Fistler for receiving Vision One rating at State Solo and Solo and Ensemble on April 14th. Prom is coming up. It is May 4th at Alexander's in Marysville. This year's theme is Candyland, and there will be a Spirit Week next week in preparation for prom. Thank you, Haley. Next, Superintendent Legislative Update. Uh, first, I'd like to apologize, Mr. Um, Ryan. Um, you have every right to ask questions. Um, I would just ask that if we ask a question, give me a chance. Last Friday, the Richmond Area Chamber of Commerce uh, held the elected officials excuse me, breakfast forum. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of going with uh, board member Worth um, and four high school students, uh, Terrence Seja, Adam Longsley, Anna Maxwell, and Haley Fortuna. Um, it was an interesting event. Um, they tied in with each of the speakers a little bit of history. We were celebrating Macomb County's 200th anniversary. So it gave a lot of tidbit historical facts about um, Macomb Township and the different uh, townships and cities that make up um, this area. So it was, a, it was a great event. So I thank the students and Mr. Worth for going and joining us. Um, Haley said the, the play was this weekend. I had an opportunity to see it on, on Saturday. It, it was unbelievable. The voices that our kids have and, and the play was James and the Giant Peach is coming up in two weeks, and not this weekend, but the, the following weekend, May, I believe it's 4th, I believe it's a Saturday, it's Sunday. Um, uh, it's not on Friday, it's Saturday, Sunday, Friday is the prom. So it's Saturday, Friday, May 
start this prom, so it doesn't look like that Saturday and Sunday. Um, there'll be two performances each day. Um, the kids will be working hard. Um, and that's really uh, good. Um, that's all right. Okay. Next, items of interest for members of the board. Anyone? I'd like to just uh, reiterate what Brian said. The public elected officials' breakfast on Friday was great. Uh, the, to hear the elected uh, officials come and speak was just a, a real, real treat. Brian, you did a great job uh, organizing it, and I was so pleased. Uh, all four girls and uh, talking to my friends at the ISD, this is, uh, this is the next few years we're going to see more and more women getting involved in politics, and I thought it was a, just a great, great place. Uh, for them to be there, and uh, really, they, they did a great job. And I know that I'm, I'm not going to go to sleep tonight unless I also apologize. I, uh, I didn't intend uh, any disrespect, but uh, my Irish gets up, and uh, so sorry about that. Anybody else? Um, I want to congratulate C.J. Wagner. He actually received a Concordia Award of the Year, and that's quite an honor because it was against a lot of um, larger division schools and um, so I wanted to congratulate him and then I also wanted to congratulate the girls bowling team. All of the bowlers received um, academic scholar athletes. Yeah, I went to the play too. Haley of course was phenomenal. That goes without saying but the, the rest of the cast just did a great job. It was, it was a good show. Anybody else? Okay, next, I'm um, looking for a motion to go into closed session. I make a motion to go into closed session. For the turning point, we need to support. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion? Okay, hearing none, I'll do a roll call. Tracy? Aye. Chris? Aye. Kyle? Aye. Sarah? Aye. Dave? Aye. Brian? Aye. And I vote aye. You're going into closed session and we will be back. Here we have the session 955. Um, before we move on to the action items, um, I'm looking for a motion to amend the agenda for um, the approval of the superintendent contract amendment number five. To add it, make it 16G. Next, approval 
Board Policies 2410, Prohibition of Referral or Assistance, 2414, Reproductive Health and Family Planning, and 2418, Sex Education. I motion to accept the recommendation of the superintendent to approve the attached board policies 2410, prohibition of referral or assistance, 2414, reproductive health and family planning, and 2418, sex education, as presented on April 9th, 2018. Sarah? Yep. It's been moved and supported. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. <clears throat> Motion carries six to one. Approval of the expansion of the equestrian club. Um, we have received a request to expand our equestrian club uh, high school program to include middle school. This request models the deck that we have similar to what we did when we expanded the um, trap shooting from the high school to the middle school. Denise Altmore would be the middle school equestrian coach. Um, they have one event that is on Saturday, June 2nd. Um, and so this would then put forward to the equestrian club at the middle school. The cost for the club, there is no cost to the district. This is considered a club. And unlike bowling, which is considered a club, um, we only really support bowling when they get to the end for states. Um, be this all the fees their riding fees as you can see in the backup I believe it's sixty dollars for one horse rider if they enter another horse it's ten dollars would be paid by the student we would not charge you pay to participate um, but they would become the Richmond uh, middle school equestrian motion to accept the recommendation of the superintendent and approve the expansion of the Richmond Equestrian Club Hearing none, all those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next, approval of repairs to high school auditorium fire suppression system. Before I get I would just like to reach out and say thank you, Mrs. Borla, for all your gentleness. I know it's very time consuming, a lot of, a lot of meetings took place in front of you, so I appreciate what you did. It's been a riding last week. Our current system is in need of repair. Uh, while it is currently functional, the, the pump and some of the other areas need replacing. It is um, put back together, but it's not a long-term fix um, so that we can continue using the auditorium. Um, through this process, we, I was able to gather a couple of quotes. One of the quotes was extremely high, which started the process. Um, I contracted George Auk construction company. I had um, worked with them in my previous district, so I asked a favor to come out. He brought his team out to really look and inspect it and saying, here's what you need. Um, and then from that, I began contacting the different companies to get a quote on that. So my recommendation is, is that they reported the newsletter because this has to get fixed. Um, um, we started it with the lowest bidder. So, uh, so Conti, uh, we're under some type of uh, umbrella for repairs on this after they put it in, or what's the normal? Yeah, there is a, um, the um, they guarantee the uh, labor for 12 months and the equipment is guaranteed so long as we have it annually inspected, um, which is one of the pieces that through this process we realize we weren't doing it on a regular basis. 
affected by Conti? It could be them, it could be PNP Fire, it could be one of the other companies, George, uh, the John Green Company's done inspections for us. It doesn't have to be them, um, but there's an annual inspection that I've really got to trim the bells, make sure the water flows, and all the water off the back of the building, and make sure it operates like it should. And parts in, in uh, the pump, I believe, is a 10 year warranty on the pump. The current system that's in there is 20 years old. Um, this morning at 11.30, the bids were opened up. We had one bidder, Huntington Public Capital Corporation. You should have received a packet from this, that was the result of, I think it's a paper for packet. Um, it's got the bid resolution, which I had given in Friday's uh, board packet, but the names are now put on here. Um, so the we're authorizing the sale of the bids for uh, to go to uh, Huntington Public Capital Corporation. Anything about the absent process or uh, we'll get the documents that need to be signed once the board authorizes it. Um, the sale will actually, there will be another set of documents that the board president, secretary, and treasurer will need to sign along with myself. Service Director and Transportation Director. 
superintendent shall have the discretion to appropriately adjust the title of or duty of said position and the FTE status of said position shall be mutually agreed upon based on the operational needs of the school district through the budget process. New language. Beginning July 1st, 2018, through the terms of this contract, unless mutually agreed upon otherwise, the school district and superintendent agree not to employ the position of director of curriculum and educational services. End section. Go ahead. Yeah. So now is that where we have the discussion? If yes. We need to add. Okay. I don't think I'm good moving forward. I just don't think we need to add. Add it to the contract? I mean, I'm good moving forward with taking the curriculum director out and putting a field uh, or facilities. Thank you, Sarah. So moved and supported. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Motion carries five to two. Um, that concludes our meeting. We are adjourned at 10.09.